to have a knack by uttering one single word of reminding someone of a co an entire conversation that they'd had in the past. He had not seen Keith for two years, but he was there in the corner of the pub with what George assumed were a couple of university colleagues. George walked over. He approached from the side at first so Keith couldn't see him. Rebottom, George said into Keith's ear. Keith was taken aback, shocked, surprised, and then recognition dawned. Ah, uh, exclaimed Keith, yes, uh, it worked. Uh, it, it worked wonders. He struggled for a moment to remember the name and then introduced George to his friends. Keith had first met George at the Cornucopia Wife Swapping's Christmas Ball. <laughs> the Cornucopia Club was essentially an organization for working well-to-do people who like to shag someone at the weekend after having shagged the same person throughout the rest of the week. <laughs> George and Mandy were old hands. George was 40, a bit stocky, but had a pleasant, affable manner. He had made his money importing fitness equipment. It paid for a large house near Thaxted, a daughter in a private school, two big dogs, and Mandy's expensive tastes. Mandy was 28, short, buxom, pouty, and glamorous. Theirs was a stable, happy relationship, which welcomed as much sex as possible. Sometimes they even hosted club events at their own house. Keith and Sophie had tentatively sent off their application to the Cornucopia Club some months before, and the Christmas Ball was the first event that they had drummed up enough courage to attend. They were both university lecturers, Keith, economics, and Sophie, anthropology. They were in their early 30s and had been married for about five years. They were the sort of people who continually examined their relationship and worried about it. Where are we at? Where are we going? And one night, during their post-coital dozing, Sophie had said, I'd love to do it with a stranger. <laughs> Sophie was tall, slim, and distinctive red hair. Keith was absolutely average in height, weight, and looks. Me too, actually, he said. If you're serious, how do we go about arranging it? How do you arrange anything, said Sophie. So they trawled the internet, and the Cornucopia Club seemed to combine the elements of sleaze and middle-class aspiration <laughs> in about the right proportions. <laughs> Emails came back full of bravado, innuendo, and encouragement. They were dubious, but excited. The Christmas ball was at a hotel in the New Forest. When they arrived, the car park was nearly full. Keith and Sophie's little Renault seemed a poor cousin to the Volvos and BMWs. But light and laughter was coming from the building, and the organizers welcomed them, welcomed them at the door and reassured them to not feel under any kind of pressure. <laughs> Everyone appeared amicable and chatty. Drink flowed. Groups of people laughed and flirted. Men had their arms around women's waists and spoke gentle filth into their ears. <laughs> <laughs> Keith and Sophie wandered into the swimming pool area. It was dimly lit, steamy, warm, and an orgy was in full swing. <laughs> A couple was on the diving board, and they were nearing their climax. People in the water was clapping to the rhythm. The sun loungers around the pool creaked under couples and threesomes. <laughs> Fuck me, <laughs> exclaimed Keith. Fuck anyone, <laughs> said Sophie. It was what they had expected, but it still came as a bit of a shock. They stood for long moments watching, but didn't want to be seen as voyeurs. That's a fabulous dress, but why not get your kit off? Said a friendly voice into Sophie's ear. She turned to see George smiling and naked. He introduced himself, and this is Mandy, who can't get enough. <laughs> Mandy giggled, <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie was attracted to George, and Keith was attracted to Mandy, and they exchanged pleasantries. Come and join us, suggested George. Of course, said Sophie. So she and Keith went to the changing room and undressed. 
I suppose this is what we came for, said Keith. Yep, said Sophie. And at the pool, they were led to the corner that George and Mandy had bagged for themselves like holiday makers. <laughs> they laid down there with their new partners, and with hardly a moment's hesitation, they were making love. It was all over in five minutes. But for Keith and Sophie, it was the best sex they'd had in years. The four of them clothed, chatted, dawning bathrobes, wandered to the lounge for drinks and food. George and Keith sat on a sofa, and the girls were separate, huddled and casting glances back at their men, joking and laughed. So what did you think of Mandy? George asked Keith. She's a cracker, said Keith, honest and simply. Isn't she just? George said proudly. Just loves to dish it around. <laughs> Great body. Rather against his instincts, Keith found that he liked this mannish talk. And uh, you enjoyed yourself with Sophie? Oh, I love a girl who makes a lot of noise. <laughs> yes, said Keith, his mind racing back to when they lived in a tiny flat in Camden and the neighbor had banged on the walls. Their conversation ambled amicably along. Keith liked George without feeling like he had much in common with him. A rather brusque businessman, a go-getter, but open and friendly. A pleasant change from his tight-assed university friends. <laughs> Keith had a gin and tonic in his right hand, and next to it, growing from the floor, in a large pot, was a philodendron. I've got one of these at home, he said. It's gone all yellow. Repotting, said George. <laughs> Keith looked at him. <laughs> Repotted. It. It's the answer to all plant problems. Repotting. <laughs> oh, said Keith. Uh, I thought I might have just overwatered it. So, Repotted. <laughs> <laughs> he could see that there was uh, some explanation to be needed. <laughs> you, you live in a house, right? Well, a flat, said Keith. Okay, a flat. How long have you lived there? said George. Since we got married, five years. And I bet you wouldn't mind living in somewhere a bit bigger. I can't afford it, said Keith. Never mind the money, said George. If you could, you'd love a bigger place. Sure, said Keith. Well, it's just like plants. It needs a bigger pot. Repot it. In the days after the orgy, Keith did report to once, and they all flourished. Keith and Sophie didn't go to any more cornucopia events, and after a few phone calls and an aborted meeting, lost touch with Mandy and George. Keith was no longer sure he wanted the swinging lifestyle. However, Sophie did start to explore her sexuality. She had a string of short affairs with men and men, some with her students, Keith became depressed. Really, despite liking what we did at that party, I really just want to stay with one person, come what may, he said. Just stay with you. That's not for me, said Sophie. She often gave the impression that Sophie was short for sophistication. The wounds didn't heal. The differences became more pronounced, and after a few months, they agreed to file for a divorce. And Keith became lonely. In the pub, Keith was desperate to prevent George from mentioning anything about wife swapping events in front of his colleagues, so we got in with a preemptive strike. Uh, we decided the club really wasn't what we wanted, he said. Uh, it's not everyone's taste, replied George pleasantly. And how is the gorgeous Sophie? Keith relayed their recent history, and George expressed his regrets. And then I moved out, said Keith. You were repotted, said George. Small pot, said Keith. <laughs> How's Mandy? He remembered her fondly. Brilliant as ever, said George. And he leaned in to Keith's ear. Goes like a fucking train. You should come and see her sometime, he said with a knowing grin. That would be nice, said Keith. A nice big pot. You'll do well. <laughs> Keith's colleagues looked across the table with a degree of puzzlement, but Keith just, Keith just smiled in his beard. He and George left the pub together. 
I'll be in touch, said Keith. Give Mandy my... He wanted to say love. Hard on, volunteered George. <laughs> okay, said Keith. And they shook hands. <laughs>